The Untold Truth of Harvey Weinstein Harvey Weinstein was one of the most powerful studio heads in Hollywood for decades. After founding Miramax with his brother, Bob Weinstein, Harvey became the biggest name in independent cinema and helped launch the careers of such visionary directors as Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. When it came to the Oscars, if Harvey was involved in a project, you could almost guarantee it was bringing home the gold. But there's a dark side to this iconic mogul that's left many observers wondering if the ends justified the means. The so-called open secret about how he treated women blew up in his face in the fall of 2017, yet if you look back at the many untold truths of Harvey Weinstein, those bombshell revelations start to look a lot less surprising. Keep reading for more. He ruled Hollywood with an iron fist. By the early 2000s, Harvey Weinstein was a dominating force in Hollywood. The guy known for busting out critical hits such as Pulp Fiction 1994 was made even more formidable when Disney purchased Miramax in 1993. You didn't want to cross him. The movie Titan had a reputation for blowing his stack at anybody and everybody. As David Carr wrote in a profile for a New York magazine, Weinstein was so powerful that supposedly no publication would run paper as he photos of him clearly assaulting a New York Observer reporter and putting him in a headlock. In New York, no one's Jews approaches Weinstein's, Carr wrote. He's got P. T. Barnum's DNA and Walt Disney's billions. As far back as 2001, Carr uncovered a red flag that suggested Weinstein might not be the most respectful guy when it comes to women. He made Gwyneth Paltrow pose in S and M garb. At Weinstein's personal request, Oscar-winning actress Gwyneth Paltrow made herself available for Carr to interview in his New York magazine profile, and she made an odd remark about being asked by Weinstein to pose in S and M garb for the debut issue of the Miramax own talk magazine, which, as Carr noted, didn't fit either her career arc or any of her personal needs. There were certain favors that he asked me to do that I felt were not exploitive, but not necessarily as great for me as they were for him, Porto said. I brought this to his attention, and he said, I will never do that again. And he's been true to his word. Porto continued. He's larger than life in every way, so his good qualities are maybe more pronounced as I some of his bad qualities. Keep in mind, Paul Drower hails from Hollywood royalty. Steven Spielberg is her godfather, so the notion that she still feels compelled to placate Weinstein and bend to his wishes speaks volume to the scope of Weinstein's power. Plus, it probably didn't hurt that he was a force of nature when it came to Oscar campaigns. He was a ruthless Oscar campaigner. By 2014, Vulture reported that Weinstein had locked down more than 300 Oscar nominations, which, for the record, is a lot. However, he has allegedly deployed a plethora of tricks and schemes over the years to garner those accolades. Weinstein also developed a supposed knack for sabotaging the competition. In 2001, when the Miramax picture in the bedroom went up against a beautiful mind, Weinstein's team allegedly tried to paint mine filmmakers as homophobic and the original book as anti-Semitic. Later, while campaigning for The Reader, 2008, he was accused of being behind the negative press that suggested Lim Dog Millionaire, 2008, exploited child actors in India. What can I say? When you're Billy the Kid and people around you die of natural causes, everyone thinks you shot them, Weinstein responded, according to Vulture. His reported ruthlessness wasn't focused on just winning Oscars. He was also allegedly relentless about making sure a movie was in theaters when he wanted it to be in theaters, even if that meant haunting a few deathbeds. He allegedly harassed Sidney Pollack on his deathbed. 
In 2008, Deadline reported that Weinstein and producer Scott Rudin traded blows over the release date for the reader after a series of setbacks delayed production and director Stephen Daly exercised his right to final cut which would have pushed the film out of the 2008 awards season and into the next year. By that time, Weinstein was no longer at Miramax and the film was being produced by the Weinstein Company which was not doing well financially. According to Rudin, Weinstein was dead set on getting the film nominated for an Academy Award for some pretty gross reasons. That same year, acclaimed producers Sidney Pollack and Anthony Minghella had died, which Weinstein supposedly viewed as the perfect opportunity for Oscar Gold. If I can't get a movie nominated that has Sidney's and Anthony's name on it this year, I should leave the business, he allegedly said. After the abrasive movie mogul reportedly became aggressive with Daldry, Rudin removed his name from the reader in protest. According to Deadline, Weinstein even went so far as to harass Minghella's widow and Pollack on his deathbed, then alleged that the late producers would have wanted the film released in 2008. Rudin called it a blatant attempt to ride the coattails of the deaths of two beloved guys. It was a bad look for Weinstein, who already had a nasty reputation, despite promising that he'd found a cure for his hot temper. He blamed bullying on his blood sugar. By the mid-2000s, Weinstein was in the middle of a public battle with Disney CEO Michael Isner and on the precipice of leaving Miramax to start the Weinstein Company with his brother and longtime business partner, Bob Weinstein. Harvey reportedly didn't have trouble securing finance from Goldman Sachs, but he did have an image problem that took a significant hit from Peter Biskin's 2004 book, Down and Dirty Pictures, Miramax, Sundance and the Rise of Independent Film. According to New York Magazine, the book included some not-so-flattering anecdotes like the one about Harvey berating director Julie Taymor after a screening of Frida 2002 and threatening to fight her husband before firing several of his assistants on the spot. Harvey did admit to the Los Angeles Times that the aforementioned confrontation happened and he screwed up, but he also started peddling an excuse. The best thing that happened to me was that I found out I was diabetic, he said. I had never admitted it because I saw it as a sign of weakness. My insulin would go up when I'd have sugar and it tickled my adrenaline gland and I'd have a metabolic reaction. So I've changed my diet. I take medicine and eat a lot of fiber. And I've gone from a number of incidents a year to perhaps one a year. As a 2017 expose in the New York Times revealed, Harvey's famous temper didn't go anywhere and he couldn't blame his next controversial move on too much sugar. He defended Roman Polanski. In 2009, Harvey Weinstein wrote an op-ed in The Independent demanding that convicted child rapist Roman Polanski be freed after the controversial director was arrested by Swiss police on an extradition order from the United States. Polanski fled to Paris in 1977 after learning that a judge planned to reject a plea bargain and sentence the director to 50 years in prison. The extradition order was ultimately ignored and Polanski was freed by Swedish authorities. In Weinstein's words, Polanski's situation represented a miscarriage of justice and the government is making him a scapegoat. In Weinstein's defense, he could not have known at the time that there were more rape accusations coming down the line for Polanski. However, Weinstein did know that Polanski had pleaded guilty to sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl, and yet he still came to his aid, which was a risky move to make in light of the skeletons in Weinstein's own closet. It seems the boisterous film mogul was still riding high on Oscar wins and had no idea his grip on Hollywood was running on borrowed time. He was accused of groping a model. By 2015, Weinstein's clout in Hollywood had declined drastically. While he once had the power to allegedly stop the media from publishing photos of him assaulting a New York Observer reporter, he now couldn't even put the brakes on an unauthorized documentary about his tyrannical reputation. And that's when the serious accusations began.
In March 2015, Page Six reported that Italian model Ambra Battilina told police that Weinstein had allegedly groped her during a meeting in a hotel room. A spokesperson for Weinstein denied the accusation and accused Battilina of blackmail, but the New York Daily News reported that the New York Police Department had set up a recorded phone call with Weinstein, who allegedly didn't deny touching Battilina. However, no charges were filed, and Batilina went on with her life. What no one knew until 2017 is that Batilina had quietly accepted a settlement from Weinstein. Soon, the whispers about Weinstein's open secret grew into a dull roar. Rumors about his gusting couch emerged. Days after the Batilina story broke, Gorka went to work compiling all of the rumors about Weinstein's alleged treatment of women, which New York Magazine reporter Jennifer Senior called a despicable open secret. According to Gorka, rumors about Weinstein's casting couch stretched all the way back to the early 90s. The publication cited pieces by Courtney and Lowe and Elaine Liu on Harvey's girls who may have been exploited by the studio head. The alleged actresses included Gretchen Mill, Jessica Alba and Blake Lively. Those rumored accusations have never been corroborated, but the story has found new life when new sexual harassment allegations against Weinstein surfaced. If the battle in a story was blood in the water for Weinstein, what followed in 2017 was a full-on feeding frenzy. Ashley Judd accused him of sexual harassment. Unlocked. 4. 2017, The Hollywood Reporter published a story that said Weinstein had assembled a powerful legal team that included famed feminist lawyer Lisa Bloom. Reportedly, both The New York Times and The New Yorker were working on separate damaging exposés about Weinstein's behavior. When asked to comment, Weinstein joked to The Hollywood Reporter, The story sounds so good, I want to buy the movie rights. But 24 hours later, Weinstein would be singing a different tune. In a bombshell report, the New York Times uncovered at least eight settlements paid to women that were allegedly harassed by Weinstein, including actress Rose McGowan. On top of that, multiple former employees went on the record accusing Weinstein of being sexually coercive. Sources describes his penchant for uncomfortable hotel room meetings where he'd allegedly make requests for women to give him nude massages, watch him shower, or engage in intercourse. One of Weinstein's alleged victims is actress Ashley Judd, who spoke to the The New York Times and described several instances of Weinstein allegedly making sexual advances toward her in a hotel room while shooting Kiss the Girls in 1997. Unlike his quip to The Hollywood Reporter, Weinstein gave a careful response to the The New York Times. I appreciate the way I've behaved with colleagues in the past has caused a lot of pain, and I sincerely apologize for it, he said. Though I'm trying to do better, I know I have a long way to go. Following the expose, Weinstein's reactions got even weirder. He quoted Jay-Z in his apology statement. In a lengthy response to the allegations reported in the New York Times, Weinstein issued an outlandish statement. Not only did he blame his behavior on coming of age in the 60s and 70s, but he also incorrectly quoted Jay-Z lyrics and concluded with a promise to bring down the National Rifle Association in response to the deadly shooting that occurred in Las Vegas on Oct. 1, 2017. It was as bizarre and as egotistical as it gets. Even more surprising is that Weinstein was able to secure the legal services of Bloom, who is known as a champion for feminist causes. Alas, it turns out that Weinstein and Jay-Z are producing a TV miniseries based on her 2014 book, Suspicion Nation. Bloom gave an odd statement of her own about advising Weinstein. She referred to him as an old dinosaur learning new ways in therapy. She also promised that he isn't going to demean or attack any of his accusers, even though he disputes their allegations. How nice. 
These careful statements and apologies only lasted a few hours before Weinstein went on the attack. He threatened to sue the New York Times. Not long after the story broke, the New York Post reported that Weinstein planned to sue the New York Times for $50 million over its reporting, which he claims is filled with false and defamatory statements. In a follow-up interview with the New York Post, Weinstein also accused the New York Times of having a vendetta against him and claimed the paper went back on a deal to tell his team about the people it had on record. While Weinstein refused to talk about which allegations were true or false, he did make a questionable statement about Judd that could be viewed as an attempt to undermine her credibility. I know, Ashley Judd is going through a tough time right now, he told the New York Post. I read her book, her memoir All That Is Bitter and Sweet, in which she talks about being the victim of sexual abuse and depression as a child. Her life story was brutal, and I have to respect her. In a year from now, I am going to reach out to her. So much for not demeaning his accusers. The New York Times expose is reportedly just the beginning. The trouble has only just begun. Weinstein may soon be forced to go to Twitter with the New Yorker too. Sources say former MSNBC host Ronan Farrow is working on a huge piece for the prestigious magazine. As politicians scramble to return his donations or give them to charity, and as actresses show support for Weinstein's accusers, it seems there's more trouble ahead for the once powerful Hollywood mogul. Check back often because we'll be sure to keep you up to date. This plot thickens.